Warning, the following podcast contains profanities used as conjunctions between other profanities. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by the new investing advice TV show for Judeo-Christians, Mad Shekels with King James Kramer. Are you an idiot looking for stock tips magically embedded within the text of the Bible? Are you an idiot looking for stock tips on a TV show? Are you willing to blindly trust a market analyst who looks like an evil version of Louis C.K.? Then let us be your shepherd to the Alpha and the Omega. Mad Shekels with King James Kramer. Bibles, buy bulls, sell bears. It's that simple. And now, the scathing atheist. Hey, Noah and Heath. It's your old pal, Iago the Pigeon. Remember when we used to get stoned together in Central Park? Well, I finally did the thing I always said I wanted to do. I was flying down Fifth Avenue looking for the pizza place where Heath used to get the bloody shits after eating the Italian sausage. When I saw... Donald, my face looks like a leper's puckered asshole Trump about to get into a limo. So I squinted and I squeezed real hard like and let out the warmest, creamiest, most foul little shit of my life. It landed with an audible plop right on top of his gigantic Neanderthal brow. And Noah, you were right. No one even noticed. But who would look twice at a shit stain, even if he had bird excrement on his forehead? Some people just don't seem to have evolved very far from filthy, stinking monkey men. But, uh, you guys are all right. It's Thursday. It's March 12th. And it's time to fluoridate the water in the Middle East so everyone can calm the fuck down. I have no illusions. I'm Heath Enright. And from Bible Crotch, Valdosta, Georgia, this is The Skating Atheist. On this week's episode, we'll glance askance at a stance advanced in France. Jesus appears in a fajita skillet to blind a healed person. And we'll convene a multinational panel of dick joke enthusiasts. But first, the diatribe. I'm sorry about this, and I'm pissed at the people who made me do it, but I'm about to agree with William Lane Craig. And I'm not talking about, you know, pepperoni pizza is awesome, raping is bad, orgasms are fun kind of agreeing. I'm about to agree with him on a theological issue. In fact, I'm about to agree with him about the definition of the word atheist in opposition to a number of prominent atheists. It never should have come to this, but somebody sent me a link to Craig's podcast with the hope that I could refute this point that he's making, and unfortunately, in this instance, I had to side with him. You know, we talk a lot in atheist circles about what the word atheist means, mostly because our intellectual opponents have such a vested interest in misdefining it. They like to try to paint a picture that obscures the burden of proof by pretending that it's incumbent upon us to disprove God's existence. You know, they like to say that atheism is just as unjustifiable as religion. After all, if I can't prove that God exists and you can't prove that he doesn't, then we're both on equal intellectual footing in some warped view of logic they like to subscribe to. Now, I don't need to waste any time pointing out the flaw in this argument. Rejecting a claim and making a claim are qualitatively different things. But what's more, atheists, at least in debate, don't generally claim that there is no God. They simply point out that the burden of proof that there is a God has not been met. This leads to a lot of graphs and Venn diagrams about the difference between knowledge and belief, theism and Gnosticism, etc., leads a lot of people to have to repeatedly make the perfectly valid argument that atheism isn't the positive statement that there is no God, it's a rejection of the positive claim that there is. That is a valid distinction. 
And because of these tireless efforts at misdirection, it's a necessary one. The problem arises when atheists try to take this same principle and apply it to the word belief. Now, I just listened to a seven-minute, very well-thought-out, very well-spoken piece where an atheist vehemently denied that atheism was the belief that there is no God, claiming instead that it was a lack of belief in gods. And that is not a valid point. Hell, it's not even a meaningful one. And yet you could hop onto YouTube right now and find dozens of very intelligent atheists fervently arguing it. So first, let me formulate the argument that I'm disagreeing with. The YouTube video I just watched used the analogy of an observer in court, right? Defendant walks into the courtroom, you know nothing about her case, she might be guilty, she might be innocent, you don't even know what she's charged of. It's not incumbent on you at this point to formulate a belief. If your friend turns to you at this point and says, well, she looks guilty, you can point out what an absurd statement that is without arguing that she's innocent. In this instance, belief needn't be binary. I can reject your claim that she's guilty without offering a positive claim that she's innocent. My position can simply be that you've not met the burden of proof. And when you're trying to make the point about whether or not atheism is a positive claim, this is a great analogy. But the analogy breaks down when you're talking about belief. Because when it comes to the God question, you're not an observer in the court. You're the judge. You can't be an impartial observer in this one because regardless of your knowledge, your belief demands action. Now, there's a billion God claims, but for this point, let's just deal with two. That there is a God and that he demands your worship. Now, you can't stand on the fence here. Either you're worshiping him or you're not. If you are, it's because you believe that he exists. If you're not, it's because you believe that he doesn't. This says nothing about what you know, of course, but one way or the other, you have to act on what you believe. If you don't worship a god or hate fags like he tells you or whatever, it's because you don't believe he exists. In fact, pretending that there's a substantive difference between saying that you believe X doesn't exist and you lack a belief that X does exist is just silly unless you're talking about something with absolutely no consequences. But when it comes to virtually all God claims, even inaction requires the formulation of a belief. If I I tell you the world is going to end if you don't dance like a chicken right now, by not dancing like a chicken, you're expressing your active disbelief in my claim. And if I tell you that you're going to burn and torment for eternity if my magical friend doesn't submerge you in the name of the space carpenter, you absolutely have to formulate a conclusion about that. You might change that conclusion as you get more or better evidence, but at all times you have to either believe it's true or false. Now, for a lot of you, of course, this seems like a silly distinction to devote an entire diatribe to, but when you're talking to theists, the difference between what a person knows and what a person believes is important as hell, and it's a lot harder to explain if there's, you know, a bunch of atheists out there confusing the issue unnecessarily. This distinction matters. When I'm arguing with a theist, I want to own the fact that I don't believe them, and that if they respect the rules of evidence and logic, they shouldn't believe them either. Theistic claims get evaluated by the same standards as every other claim. So no, I'm not making the positive claim that God doesn't exist, but I am making the positive claim that the evidence for God's existence is insufficient to warrant belief. And if I dance around this by trying to draw a line between disbelief and lack of belief, I'm undercutting that point in an effort to confuse the semantics. What's more, I'm weakening the point that the burden of proof is on them by retreating way further than logic would dictate. Hell, it's like I'm saying that I don't even have the burden of proof to demonstrate that you have the burden of proof. And like I said, a lot of very prominent atheists disagree with me here, so if I'm misrepresenting the point or I'm just incorrect, I invite them to point out where I fucked up my logic. After all, I'm not saying you're definitely wrong, but I'm definitely saying I believe you are. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast and bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight is avant-guardian of the galaxy, Heath Enright. Heath, are you ready to push the artistic boundaries of galactic preservation? I am Groot. But with an E-A-U-X. There you go. The X is silent, hillbillies. Pay attention. In our lead story tonight, the French government offered a proposal this week that might be even more offensive to language than their ridiculous abundance of silent letters. <laughs> Justice Minister Christian Taubirach. Tob- Tob- nice. Yeah, know, that's whatever, exactly how it's is pronounced. Is pushing for legal reforms that would treat online hate speech, quote, much in the same way they do with pedophilia, end quote. What, it'll only be tolerated if it represents a sincerely held religious belief? That's... Hey, if, that? if you said that in French, you'd be a wanted man. <laughs> now, this law is clearly targeted at the rising tide of anti-Semitism in the country, but likely also comes in response to this year's huge spike in offensive cartoonists being gunned down on the international stage. The it, proposal yeah. would allow the government to shut down websites containing hate speech without receiving approval from any court. The justice minister describes this as part of an unmerciful battle against anything on the Internet that insults religious groups or ethnic minorities. In the interest of full disclosure, of course, that's what Heath and I do for a living. <laughs> right. So, uh, Are they aware that lots of the Internet comes from outside of France? Right. That's where a lot of it's from. <laughs> and that lots of those 
other countries will be maintaining free speech. We're, we're, we're keeping it. Un- for unfortunately now. for the French, yes. Now, it's worth noting that France probably has the most draconian hate speech laws in Europe. And if you're keeping score at home, it hasn't eradicated the anti-Semitism. <laughs> exactly. Now, this new effort is just an attempt to broaden the scope of their already egregious buggery of free speech. And it's not like the law only pushes the bigots away. A, a story at uh, Reason.com pointed to a woman who's been arrested five times for calling halal slaughter barbaric, as well as a novelist being charged for pointing out that Islam is, quote, the most stupid religion, end quote. Okay, what about if a non-religious person takes a fully conscious cow and hacks open its jugular vein, carotid artery, and windpipe with a giant saber, then watches it suffocate and bleed to death. Can we criticize that guy for being a psychopath, or is it... O- only if it doesn't offend them. Now, obviously, free speech has had far more articulate defenders than myself, but it's worth reflecting on the kind of insanely stupid shit religious people get offended by. And what France is doing is handing the reins of public discourse over to the most thin-skinned slice of their populace. What they're doing is preventing another Charlie Hebdo massacre by silencing the victim and in so doing more than subtly endorsing the crime. Yeah, seriously, fuck you guys. Try getting that off the internet. Yeah, right. (laughs) And from the in and out patient file tonight. The medical board that governs healthcare practices in Ontario, Canada, has recently adopted a new rule that... I would have assumed was already the rule, which now requires doctors to attempt saving the life of dying people during an emergency, regardless of any personal beliefs that might interfere with them. But outside of immediately life-threatening situations like that, doctors are still allowed to continue being as arbitrary and bigoted as they want, and are permitted to refer patients elsewhere when being a good doctor conflicts with their beliefs. But but should to do that. All medical treatment conflict with your religious belief. I mean, God right. put that tumor there for a reason. You're just fucking with his plan right. here. Maybe you shouldn't be a doctor. Now, as you might imagine, the problems that arose to make this regulation necessary in the first place involved religious healthcare professionals refusing to do their entire job, for example, failing to prescribe birth control or other contraceptives despite patient requests. And while the new rule still allows for questionable behavior like that, it does draw the line well before extreme cases like, say, an ER doctor denying a critical blood transfusion or refusing to treat complications from an abortion procedure. Again, kind of creepy that this is a new rule, but Mm -hmm. I guess it's better late than... Legalized negligent homicide. So right, right. And old saying. I'm going to borrow Bill Maher's bit for a second here. New rule. <laughs> if your devotion to your sky daddy causes you to let a person die when you could have saved them, you don't get to call that a moral objection. No. It's the exact opposite <laughs> right. of that. And although the only beliefs in question here are those that would have a doctor watch a patient die of treatable causes on the table in front of them like a maniacal sociopath... The new regulations have met with plenty of criticism, criticism, including the Ontario Medical Association. Opponents are arguing that it'll force doctors to sacrifice their religious beliefs for the sake of human life. Supporters are making the same argument. Yeah, right. Bottom line, you can say whatever you want and you can believe whatever you want, but we live in a fucking society, so why on earth would you believe you always get to do whatever you want? Your your freedom radius only extends as far as that of the next person. It's pretty right. simple. Yeah. Uh-huh. Swinging fist, nose, you know. <laughs> and in this church might be a church news tonight. The University of Arizona is investigating allegations that the Faith Christian Church, which has operated on their campus for a quarter century, is a cult, which is what religious people call religions when they're so religious, <laughs> even religious people can't endorse them anymore. Mega church, micro church, micro penis. Are we splitting hairs? With the penis, yes. Now, a number of former members and staffers have recently come forward with allegations that the church used public shaming techniques, coerced money from its members, alienated members from their parents, and encouraged shunning of those who leave the church. Hmm. So, basically, Jehovah's Witnesses, but you can still wish them a happy birthday. (laughs) I don't see how Here's the thing. Aren't cults just really, like, smaller versions of religion? And don't they tend to do their murdering internally for the most part i mean still not a good thing to have but isn't it a lot better than full-blown religions at least most things are former members claim to have suffered from ptsd after leaving the church and described their recruitment methods as insidious again not sure how this differentiates from all other churches though i do think it's worth noting that the university said it was unable to respond to the allegations earlier because of arizona laws that require state agencies to neither inhibit nor promote religion also worth noting that nobody involved with this will ever be punished for the same reason Fantastic. And in Mound Zero news tonight, anti-Muslim activist and conservative blogger Pamela Geller recently published a 
ranting screed of a column on right. World Net Daily, in which her paranoid fear of academia led her to accuse the entire current generation of young people of having a leftist Islamic agenda similar to that of Nazis. All of them. That they're now imposing on everyone else. Mm -hmm. Then, to make it extra ranty and screedy, she quoted from the seminal work in that field, John Galt's mind-numbingly boring 70-page long speech from Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged. Yeah, which represents about 8% of the mind-numbingly boring parts of that book. <laughs> and then she followed that up with a quick mention about global warming being a myth to bolster her critical thinking cred, and finally closed it out by awarding her Most Disgusting Jew on the Planet Award to Which John Stewart, her words. she has, for being a secret jihadist undercover agent. Quote, This vicious traitor, smug and self-righteous, has long been working for the other side under the guise of comedy. The other side? Vile. John Stewart defines self-loathing Jew. End quote. Big hard J-bomb there. Now, that sounds a lot like jealousy to me. I'm guessing Geller's just pissed that the conservative Jewish libertarians like herself were left out of the big media conspiracy, and they're kind of well, getting fucked now. She even kind of said that. She ended it with uh, like wondering when HBO or Comedy Central was going to get around to having a conservative comedian host a show, and she actually mentioned <laughs> Dennis Miller by name. The answer, by the way, is 1994 to 2002. It was called Dennis Miller Live. And worst Dumbass. Monday Night Football host ever. Oh, my God. It was so painful. And in Appellate Bee's news tonight, an appeals court has held that a New Jersey man who burned his face while praying over his meal can't sue Applebee's for failing to warn him that the sizzling sound the skillet was making meant it was hot. Hmm. The suit that wasn't stemmed from a 2010 incident in which Hram uh, Jimenez... Again, spot on. Yeah, I'm good at that. ...was <laughs> forsaken by God while praying for the Applebee's food to turn into something that wasn't shit. <laughs> okay. Before I bring you out that skillet of sizzling hot food, maybe you want to stick your face into the picture on the menu and pray <laughs> first. No? No, you want me to bring you the food in a bottom-weighted sippy cup instead? There's a lot of <laughs> safety measures we can take for you. No, according to his complaint, he bowed his head over his meal and realized something was wrong when he, quote, felt a burning sensation in his left eye and face, end quote. That burning sensation, by the way, was burning. And just in case intentionally sticking your face into a sizzling, steaming cast iron skillet wasn't amusing enough for the other restaurant patients. It was. He then panicked and knocked the skillet into his lap. Which was even better. The court held that the meal, which is described on the menu as the hot fajita skillet, represented an open and obvious danger, and that the waitress had nothing to do with Mr. Jimenez being an idiot. Now, just to be safe, though, I don't want to open ourselves up to any kind of litigation, so before we toss things over to Lucinda, I'm going to warn you, she's smoking hot. A man wrote the Bible? A whore is what she was. If it's a legitimate race. It's a slut, right? It, cooking can be fun. Hey, I'm proud of a man. This Week in Misogyny. International Women's Day started in 1909 to commemorate a textile strike that never actually happened. But despite its apocryphal origins, the celebration has spread over the entire world over the last century. In some places, it's just a hybrid of Mother's Day and Valentine's Day, but for most of us, it's a day about women forcing their way into the political and economic arena, or at least continuing to try. So this week, I thought we'd take an international tour and see how the day was being commemorated in different parts of the world. We'll start in China, where the national government decided to recognize some of their most prominent warriors for women's rights by inviting them to jail. That's right, no fewer than 10 of China's most well-known agitators for women's rights were rounded up during a March 8th crackdown on dissidents, who were targeted for handing out pamphlets to raise awareness for sexual harassment. It's worth noting that even though International Women's Day has always been more popular in communist countries, the state of women's rights in China is abhorrent. Most job openings still advertise that they're looking for men only, and when women are allowed to apply, it's usually with bizarre chauvinistic stipulations like applicants must be demure and very graceful. But in Taiwan, they opted not to spend the day arresting women, so much as publicly fat-shaming them. For some reason, the Taiwanese government chooses March 8th to release its annual report on how chunky the ladies are getting. According to the Department of Health, a frightening 33.6% of women exceed the recommended waistline of 80 centimeters, or about 31 and a half inches. And if being told you're too fat isn't enough, they would also be happy to show you that you're too fat through a bunch of government-sponsored waistline measuring events where you can find out if you're exceeding the recommended muffin top allowance. 
Interesting, but not surprising, that Taiwan doesn't even publish similar numbers for men, nor do they issue municipal proclamations about how many vegetables men should eat, nor how many minutes of a day they should walk. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not against governments offering sound advice on keeping in shape, but if you reduce the metric of women's health to the size of their waistline, it's not because of your genuine concern for their well-being. Come on. And finally, we'll move to Afghanistan to give some props to a very badass and Afghani artist, Kubra Kadimi, who is such a warrior for women's rights that she needs a suit of armor. After paying a local blacksmith to fashion some plate mail with exaggerated boobs and ass, she took to the streets of Kabul in a silent protest of ever-present groping and harassment throughout the city. And as it turns out, groping is only the first level of misogyny in Afghanistan, because very quickly the suit of armor became functional when the assholes in the crowd started hurling rocks at her. Since the protest, Kadimi has gone into hiding after receiving a series of death threats. That's right, death threats. For daring to not have her tits fondled by strangers. Can you imagine? And as fucked up as all of that is, I do want to throw some major support behind a dozen or so men that took to the street in burkas in a show of solidarity with Kadimi. So yes, there are plenty of victories to commemorate through the first 106 International Women's Days, but it looks like there's at least 106 years more worth of fighting to do. And on that depressing point, I'll hand things back over to Noah and Heath. Thank you, Lucinda. And in picture of Doran Graying news tonight, if you were wondering whether it's possible to insult the entire gay community, as well as the mentally disabled, the physically disabled, and rape victims all in one interview and still make it endearing to the audience using a charming Irish accent, you cannot. That does not (laughs) work. (laughs) This was confirmed last week when a real person that's not from Middle Earth, I swear, called Kevin Doran, Bishop of Elfin, appeared (laughs) on the News Talk (laughs) Breakfast Show, where he laid out the Catholic perspective on a new piece of legislation in Ireland that would allow gay couples to have equal rights when it comes to adoption. Uh And... Not surprisingly, the guy who now presides over about 70,000 Catholics is against the equal rights for gay people. And there was no solid floor to this dude's insanity. I mean, I'm watching this video and I keep saying, oh, there's that must be the terribly egregious thing he said that got everybody so pissed to share this. No, wait, (laughs) wait. I swear, swear, if they left the camera rolling long enough, he'd have been explaining how sometimes those puppies just have it coming. (laughs) So how does he get from a stance against gay adoption rights that I just described to insulting disabled people and rape victims? Great question. (laughs) After being asked whether God intended for homosexuality to exist, Doromir had this to say, quote, that would be to suggest that if some people who are born with Down syndrome or spina bifida, that that was what God intended either, end quote. Well, (laughs) from there, and maybe this was just good editing from the guys thing, but (laughs) from there... From God being omnipotent except for gays, cripples, and retards, the segment managed to eventually segue to Doran's feeling on abortion, Uh which included a proclamation that we can't have rape victims, quote, getting back at their attackers by terminating the pregnancy. What? And he's back to bacon. Right. right. Great job. (laughs) Interesting to know that failing to carry someone's child to term is revenge. Apparently right now all of Earth is simultaneously taking revenge on... Dorandrathil, son of Nandor's son of Lenwa Honda, by not being pregnant with his rape spawn. Take that, asshole! And in Cloudy with a Chance of Brimstone news tonight, End Times Nut and elderly constipated Conan O'Brien Rick Wiles took to the airwaves last week to string together the only series of words he and I will ever agree on. While discussing the upcoming Supreme Court decision regarding the legality of gay marriage with failed congressional candidate and self-published author John Price, he suggested that all the queer hate and God-fearing Christians get the fuck out of the country. Do you do you guys need help packing right? rides to the airport? <laughs> exactly. One last buggering for old time's sake? We can set that all up for you. Now, flaunting the accuracy of biblical prophecy, Price warned of a coming, quote, really major troublesome thing, end quote, that God will doubtless <laughs> unleash upon America if and when the Roberts Court finally endorses butt sex, and then went on to discuss his own plans to move to Costa Rica, where he can continue to hate fags as God intended. Yeah, this guy thinks there's a prophecy about a society called the Daughter of Babylon Mm -hmm. that's just about to fall amidst major social upheaval, not realizing that Babylon gave birth to what is now Iraq, and also seemingly unaware of any sort of conflict in that region, 
Wiles thinks the United <laughs> States is that daughter of Babylon. Except. When it suits him, yeah. No, I'm not usually one to indulge in delusions, but if it gets Rick Wiles' listeners the hell out of my democracy, I can bend my principles a little. So, yes, atheist Jesus agrees. <laughs> you guys are totally right. It's all brimstone and sodomy from here on out. Plagues, rivers of blood, moons of sex. Hell, even the locusts are going to be gay when these plagues come. There will be devil music <laughs> everywhere. Nobody will be allowed to watch Duck Dynasty. That's our master plan, and all we're waiting for is to gay marriage piece to fall into place. Get out while the getting's good. Tick tock. <laughs> and from the notoriously girthy anal P-robes file tonight, Pat Robertson followed up on last week's vegetable slavery remarks with some bigoted commentary on gay marriage and a warning about how to avoid catching the Buddhism. Yes, he did. <laughs> now, you might be asking yourself, isn't this just... Some senile Christian lunatic whose ignorant rants should be ignored? Mm -hmm. Yes, that mm -hmm. would be ideal. But considering about a million people watch his show every day, yeah. it's hard to pretend he's just a crazy fringe voice and that he doesn't represent large numbers of dangerous-minded American citizens. Because he clearly does. And that's an enormous problem. Well, so we're going to talk about and it. And besides, he's not... A senile Christian lunatic whose ignorant rant should be ignored. He's the senile Christian lunatic whose ignorant rant should be ignored. Show some respect. <laughs> so let's start with his recommendation for parents whose children are getting married to a same-sex partner. Robertson says, These parents should not attend the wedding because if either mom or dad does show up, the kid might stay gay longer. He thinks boycotting, on the other hand, Don't might ask. speed up that convalescence process. <laughs> Personally, I guess P. Robes just needs some deep dicking, and he'd get on board. Now, loosen him up a little bit to the whole thing. If there are any listeners, by the way, that would like to volunteer for that, let us know, and we'll definitely set that up when he contacts us, which yeah, and before he regularly you, does. Before you recoil in horror here, keep in mind that you haven't lived until you have had a good jowl job. <laughs> he just wraps it around your junk. His head's already shaken anyway from just being old. <laughs> Find it's a cheek awesome. fold and fuck it. <laughs> and finally, his most recent nugget of wisdom during Monday's episode of the Septa Centenarian Club, Robertson warned his audience about the dangerous disease called Buddhism and offered some suggestions about how to make sure you remain an ego-driven asshole that is separate from everything right. if you're in that Buddhist environment. In particular, if you find yourself in a work environment with lots of carriers of the noble eightfold pathogen, it's best to quote... Withdraw with dignity, because they're going to get to you before you get to them. God doesn't and like it when you pull out. <laughs> and, and by that, I think he means quit your job in a fearful panic, unless, of course, your strain of Christianity is powerful enough to infect all the Buddhists first. Yes, I think that's preemptively. what he was going for. And unlike Pat Robertson's testicles and Jesus, the headline segment still has more to come. But first, we'd like to take a quick minute to talk about all the sexual gratification that comes with voting for us in the People's Choice Podcast Awards at podcastawards.com every day until March 24th. Smoke them if you got them. Sometimes, when you want something bad enough, you go after it so hard that you start to lose a sense of perspective. And I think we can all agree as we watch the campaign for your vote in the religious inspirational category of the podcast awards devolve into mudslinging, personal attacks, and outright vitriol. That at a certain point, we all have to step back and remind ourselves what really matters. So for that reason, we'd like to take a minute tonight to address some of these scurrilous attacks that have been circulating about some of our esteemed opponents in this race. We're going to start with the rumors about David from My Book of Mormon secretly keeping a harem of underage Indonesian sex slaves. But in truth, we have no idea what nationality his harem of underage sex slaves are. These are things the public deserves to know. Likewise, for the accusations against Seth Andrews of the Thinking Atheist podcast. Sure, it's hard to believe that so many unsourced reports that accuse him of puppy kicking would surface at the same time. But it still could be coincidence. And as for the defamatory reports that the Mormon Faircast and Mormon Discussion have pooled their resources in an effort to bring down all the national governments and replace them with a worldwide theocracy based in Salt Lake City, well, that's, that, that's common knowledge. They, they pretty it's, much admit to the that. whole thing with the show. Yeah. Um, how about Paula White from Paula White's Hope for Today? Does she really operate a string of prostitution parlors slash sweatshops? I don't know. And neither does America. So, you know, you do the math. Are Matt and Ben of the sci-fi Christian bionic replicant sent here to soften the world for the coming alien enslavement of our race? I guess that would answer a lot of questions, sure. But there's no concrete evidence. Yet. 
And is Are You Just Watching a Really Stupid Name for an Audio Podcast? Of course it is. But that doesn't mean that the people producing it are the ones that keep taking that paper that you thought was on your desk and then hiding it and then putting it back on your desk later just to make you feel stupid. And does Infants on Thrones sound like it's about watching children pee? Sure it does. But that, that doesn't necessarily mean... No, no, I guess... One way or another, that's pretty yeah. fucked up. Mm-hmm. Especially if Gwyneth Paltrow's vaginal steam kettle is involved in any way whatsoever. Does this show involve boiling water under an infant's genitals? Again, how can we be sure? We're just asking questions here. <laughs> and is there another one that I forgot the name of, but also probably has nefarious plans to destroy the world if they can just get their hands on the podcast award trophy that will power their doomsday device? Probably. But that's no reason for us to step into the mud and sacrifice our integrity. So here at The Scathing Atheist, we pledge to run a clean, honest, and positive campaign for your vote. One that highlights the mutual respect that we have for all of the other nominees. Which is far more than you can expect from those assholes. Damn straight. That's right. Returning to headlines once more, we'll turn to the OK, but could you at least stop calling it Pop File, where Michigan mayor and human version of the chicken that's always trying to fuck Foghorn Leghorn is back in the news being a whiny bitch in a totally new way. Me and Lucinda looked at the picture for so long trying to figure out who it was. She's just like, it's a chicken, and it's like, it's Miss Prissy. Now, you might have heard about Mayor Fouts when he picked a fight with local atheists seeking to open a reason station next to the prayer station that's been in City Hall there forever. Or perhaps you remember him from his guest spot as the chick with the fucked up spine in Pet Cemetery. God, <laughs> He Jesus. is also, I believe, the lender of last resort when major banks run out of forehead space. <laughs> about the real estate. The third ugliest person in the history of humandom. Anyway, motivated by a fear that if the citizenry had ready access to reason, they'd move the hell out of Detroit, Fouts blocked the reason station right up until a court politely reminded him that he's the mayor of 117th of Detroit, not the fucking emperor. But the $100,000 in legal fees that his tantrum cost the city wasn't enough to dissuade his impudent assholery, so he's responding by handing out In God We Trust posters from his office to anybody who wants to shake him in the faces of those damn godless heathens with that dumb devil booth down there so this guy wasted a hundred grand in tax revenue by violating the first amendment mm-hmm. and now he's printing money to hand out in protest of atheism. Right. great plan great yeah plan. when asked if the poster giveaway was retaliation for the court ruling fouts didn't even have the good sense to say no publicly he also warned that if this tactic fails to fully express the general poo-poo headedness of non-christians he's also prepared to hold his breath until he turns blue and or go to his room but not because you told him to but because he wants la to. la la can't hear you <laughs> And from the don't need a weatherman to know which way the priest blows file tonight. Pope Frankie Four Seasons and the broken watch that is Catholicism may be approaching reality again for a rare partial eclipse. Everybody get excited because the church is just about to make a call on all this global warming stuff. Finally. Finally, yeah. And a sneak peek at the highly anticipated papal encyclical on climate change reveals that Catholicism plans to officially endorse the use of thermometers to measure temperature, starting sometime later this spring. Yeah, yeah. Strange that the infallible guy would need to float trial balloons on this one or have a team of advisors at all. But but this is pretty consistent, I think, with Catholic adaptation of cutting-edge science. You know, Fahrenheit figured out the whole mercury and the thermometer thing around 1714, I believe. 301 years later, Vatican is right on board. That's that's actually quick for them. That's better than average. Now, (laughs) according to the head guy over at the... Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace named Peter Turkson. He's uh, the guy who helped draft the document. It's going to contain concessions that the planet is, in fact, getting warmer, but it won't be saying why. Could <laughs> right. be people causing all the CO2 emissions. Could be plants. There's no way of knowing. <laughs> but regardless of the cause, it says in Genesis that we're not supposed to fuck up the planet. So thanks to those Jewish tree huggers from way back in the day, Catholics, too, are supposed to be environmentally conscious, whether or not they're playing into a liberal science conspiracy. Whether they, they have like to. it or they not. Have to. And finally, tonight, we have yet another in an ongoing rash of Australian pedophile stories. We've covered pedophile Australian Catholics and pedophile Australian Jews in the last few weeks, so it's only <laughs> fitting that we add a story about a pedophile Australian Muslim to round the Abrahamic child-fucking trifecta out. Wouldn't want to get offensive. Exactly. Joining us to do so and possibly shed some light on what kind of child-fucking hormones they're putting in the Australian drinking water is <laughs> genuine Australian Adam Reeks from the Herd Mentality Podcast. Adam, welcome back to the show. Greetings. Thank you. Let me put down my coffee and pick up some tap water. <laughs> 
And since unlike most of the Australian pedophile stories we've been covering recently, this one involves a female. We thought we'd also bring on a genuine female, Ra, Ooh. also from the Herd <laughs> Mentality Podcast. Exotic. Ra, welcome to The Scathing Atheist. Thank you for having me. This, now, I believe this would be your first time on a podcast award-nominated show, isn't it? <laughs> Feels good, doesn't it? It's exciting. Um, I don't know. I don't listen to any of them at all. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> Awesome, awesome. We're the one with Neil deGrasse Tyson, then. Right. <laughs> well, uh, I just think any any podcast that has me on it, I, I won't be listening to it because it's shit. <laughs> Such low standards. And a awesome. fair judge, too. Yeah, it was awesome. I, I, I just <laughs> hope that you put that on an iTunes review for us. Um, now, so basically the story we've got here, this is essentially the classic story of a Lebanese Muslim residing in Australia who asked himself one day, what would Muhammad do? And since the historically accurate answer is fuck a preteen, that's exactly what he did. Of course, as a good Muslim, he wanted to make an honest pederast victim out of her, so he married her first and then raped her. So, Adam, I want to start with you because I really don't know the laws in your hemisphere there. Is it legal to fuck seventh graders in Australia? Great Only if you do it legally. <laughs> Look, to be fair to the guy, it wasn't just a case of marrying her and then uh, doing... Hor horrible things to her. He at least went to the trouble of stalking her. Yes. Quite, uh, quite a bit, you know, just to kick the relationship off, get things off to a good start. So, uh, look, I guess he's to be commended for at least trying before succeeding, not just being given all the success straight up. Wow. Well, yeah, I guess I guess he's trying harder than the Catholics generally. Way to put a, a positive spin on it. Now, Ra, I know that uh, you're not in a Muslim country, but according to Fox News, you are. Uh, so well, you obviously haven't been to Birmingham. I sure, exactly. To say, well, I'm not allowed. You're not allowed to go there. <laughs> so, so uh, as as a uh, a woman in a Muslim country, wh where do you stand on prepubescent betrothal? Are you for or against? Um, well, you know, I I would think you would. Who's you know, that's not my kids and just start laughing. <laughs> um, no, I am completely against it. It's abhorrent and vile. The giggle is not exactly selling abhorrent and vile, but I'm going to take your word on it. So <laughs> now, <okay. laughs> making it worse. Yeah, of course, the <laughs> <laughs> Russ just had. I'm just a bit nervous because of that nine year old I'm keeping in the basement for oral sex. But yeah, go on. <laughs> Joining us live from Austria. <laughs> well, the uh, younger so you get, too. I mean, when they're still teething, it's a lot easier to get oh, God. without as much pain. Oh, much. I'm just saying, like, if, you, if you're already disgusting, why not push it all the way down? Whatever. In case anybody was <laughs> wondering who was going to go further with the child fucking story, it was going to be Heath. No surprise there. So now, of course, the real horror of the story isn't. The wedding, so much as the statutory rape that it preceded, the victim slash bride got pregnant shortly after their wedding night, and because she's a fucking kid, she miscarried. So, no, this is not one of those pederast stories with a happy she ending. Should have got a preemie up. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> So now I, I'm sure a lot of the audience is, is probably asking themselves, you know, hey, how does one go about marrying a 12-year-old Muslim girl in Australia? But don't worry. They're just asking for a friend. Um, now, as you said, Adam, it, I believe step one was stalking her incessantly. It wins young hearts over. That's, I guess so. Uh, so once all the stalking took place and the hearts were won over, the gentleman he went and spoke to his uh, sheik of choice, perhaps, got knocked mm -hmm. back. Uh, because the first one <laughs> was rational and said, ah, no, yeah, no that's illegal. Uh, tried a couple and found one in presumably some garage somewhere who said, yeah, I'll marry you to a nine-year-old girl. No problems. Twelve-year-old. Twelve, uh, be fair. Sorry, twelve-year-old. <laughs> yeah, she, a, a complete, uh, she's an old maid compared to Aisha. You it's know, like so. middle school already. Yeah. <laughs> So now what I found most interesting about this story, before we get to the, before he got to the imam anyway, that, that, that finally would marry him, according to the story, he got help from a member of her family. It didn't specify what. So I'm just wondering how that conversation, you know, like you, you gotta walk up to some guy at, uh, at, at temple or whatever, whatever they have, mosque or whatever, and you go, uh, so that, uh, that niece of yours sure is filling out that training bra nicely. You think you could, uh, put in a good word? I mean, like, just what kind of sick fucking bastard says, oh, yeah, 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 no, I'll, what are you, 27? Yeah, I'll hook you up with my 12-year-old No, niece. do you realize who you're talking to? The, we, both Ra and I are 
by your uh, description there, sick bastards. But we're also very good at a little bit of role play. So if you would like us to play, <laughs> say, the parents <laughs> of this young child. The parents? She, no, I want to be, I want to be the child bride. Uh, yeah, but, but you don't have an, you don't get a say. Well, if you're the child bride, then you're definitely uh, uh, not getting a say. Is definitely getting you into character. You're gonna have some really weird lines. Hey, can you put on a woman's voice? (laughs) (laughs) I'll see what I can do. I'll see what I can do. Thursday. You got it. All right, now that's going to be the opening of the show right there. <laughs> so now it's important to point out that, like, at, you know, like I said, no happy ending here, but at least the guy went to jail. Um, and I think this is a coincidence, but he is uh, eligible for parole right around her 18th birthday. So <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, but he won't be interested in her by then. She'll have pubes. That's the yeah, right. Exactly, exactly. It's the world's biggest <laughs> happy ending, really. And yeah, all right. <laughs> So and then of course the the imam um, you said that you know you went to a couple of them that told told them hey you know you can't do that unfortunately none of them said you know hey I'm gonna call the police if you don't mind sitting right there but eventually you did find an imam that would do it and he also got punished now tell me this isn't some light shit he had his visa revoked and he was fined five hundred dollars <laughs> for wow. aiding and abetting and statutory rape now that's by the way five hundred Australian dollars well, like seven bucks American of uh, twenty thousand <laughs> Tajikistani and pebbles. So it's not very much at all. So now, what do you guys use in 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 England, Roz? It, it's squids, hay pennies. What do you guys have, <laughs> money wise? Oh, uh, no, we just use gold. <laughs> so, yeah, just running that's, like John Gold Valley, it, with a picture with a picture of the Queen's clunge on it. Regina is actually <laughs> vagina in Latin. <laughs> Nice, okay. nice. Interesting Sorry. to know. Now you understand what I have to do on the editing front. Whenever so you guys, is, oh, but see, the, the thing is that that kind of shit gets edited out of your show, Adam, <laughs> not ours. <laughs> the, the the clunge jokes never go. Um, so now, so basically, what you're saying is you haven't updated your monetary units since America updated their units of measure, and that's I think commendable. You know, yeah, which is, we're yeah, sticking we like, with it. We like it. tradition, like you know, like Muslims like child rape. Well, not all Muslims, oh dear, here we go. I sort of generalized. But they, but they all like <laughs> child rapists, though. That's that's a 100 percenter because they yes. all seem to like that well, Muhammad they, fellow. They like, you know, the ultimate child rapist, don't they? That's it, right. who they revere. Yeah, well, well yeah. and of course, priests continue to rape children. Yeah, it's a time. You know, if, if, if um, little boys could get pregnant, the Catholic Church would <laughs> open a franchise of abortion clinics. Well, now that's that's probably going <laughs> to solve the problem there with their prehistoric views on abortion. We just need to find a way to make 12 get little boys pregnant. pregnant. Orally, yeah. <laughs> it's, All right. it's, it's not for lack of trying. <laughs> get them a latte or something. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you can't get pregnant up the ass or in the mouth. I know this because that's my form of contraception. <laughs> and I'm still childless now. Now, there is actually kind of a larger question uh, uh, around this whole thing. And I think these insular religious communities and the feelings within them that the religious custom somehow supersedes national law. And obviously we've got these uh, in the U.S. We've got plenty of them. I've seen some terrifying re- reports out of the U.K. with regards to the ubiquity of female genital mutilation in, in the Muslim population there. Obviously Australia's got some of this problem. So what do you think is the right national approach? Should we be trying to respect the culture? Should we be trying to integrate the culture? Should we go full France and just try to outlaw the culture? What do you, what do you guys feel is the right direction there? Well, this is what's currently being brought to light by the Royal Commission in Australia, we're now mopping up from the last, oh God, 60, 80 odd years of abuses of human rights. And from that, we'll begin developing new laws, new protection. So uh, do we go full France? I don't think that's the answer. Telling people what to wear is certainly not the answer. Telling people what to believe is not the answer. You can guide them in the right direction, but no, it's a really curly one. Tempting to say, yes, believe what I believe, but then that makes me no different to these insular religious communities. That Except that you're against child rape. Yeah, that would be the <laughs> <laughs> Yes, by and large, not a fan of that. But Ra and I often speak off air about the horrendous FGM issue that's taking place because where Ra is based in the UK is chock-a-block full of this Somali community where 
it seems labias and clitori are seen as highly prized <laughs> objects for taxidermists over there. Is that what they do with them? Can I just say, when you, when you correctly use the uh, plural of clitoris, it makes my clitoris happy, just saying. <laughs> Both of them. I, I love, yes, <laughs> it makes my clitori happy. <laughs> I do love grammar. Love a um, Latinized pluralization that's so hot. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, it's hot in here, but it's probably because I haven't taken my HRT. <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> yes, there is a huge problem of um, FGM where I work, especially because there's a huge um, sort of African uh, Muslim population. And I see victims of, of FGM on a on a regular basis which you know brings me to answering um your question about should we respect other cultures and try and integrate i mean i I don't think it's black or white i think it's uh, shades of gray yes it would you know i'm I'm not a fan of for example banning the burqa that to me seems quite extremist which yes i know a lot of women would not wear you know the burqa freely Maybe but something some that's do. forced upon sure. them, but some do, and it seems a little bit draconian to me to then say, "Well, you can't wear that because it's oppressive." Well, that sounds to me a little bit oppressive too. When it comes to customs and traditions, which inflicts, you know, a, a degree of harm onto people, so FGM, for example, I understand it isn't a Muslim tradition, but unfortunately, in the UK, and I can only speak to the UK, it is. only practiced by Muslim communities, certainly where I am anyway. No, but I'm I'm glad that you made that point, though, because I think a lot of people don't recognize the fact that there are a lot of Christian cultures in Africa that practice FGM as well. Yes. Oh, absolutely. It's not not an Islamic thing. Um, It's a religion. Everybody here sounds like Reza Aslan all of a sudden. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to dispute that. Because I, I did research the statistics on the countries that are performing FGM, and statistically, the countries with the highest FGM rates in Africa are the Islamic nations. Yes, oh, I yeah, you know, that's you Islamic in origin. That's what I'm trying to say. FGM mm-hmm. isn't Islamic in origin. So it's it would be dishonest to say this is an exclusively Islamic practice because there are other religions that do it. So it's not just Islam. And like I said, in, in Bristol, where I live, all the patients that I see that are victims of FGM happen to be Muslims. I've never come across a non-Muslim victim. So, you know, it, it isn't black and white. There are certain things that need to be contested. It need to be challenged. And we have to get away from this idea that we must preserve cultural traditions and feelings for the sake of not upsetting people because... If you don't speak out against these, these atrocities, that's when children are forced into marriage and raped and have their genitals mutilated and a number of other, you know, hideous, grotesque practices. I, I am, I, I just, I'm trying not to imagine a day at work for you where you're seeing this sort of thing on a regular basis. That's got to be just terrible. Also trying not to picture this wedding in general, but you know, because we're extremely twisted people, we started considering what kind of music would be most appropriate for this wedding venue. And That's did we? <laughs> we did. We did. And that means we're going to need 30 seconds on the clock. Ding, ding, ding. We're going to be looking for songs to play at a Muslim pedophile wedding. Go. Look, I'm a big fan of you uh, 2 so what about Where the Fetus Has No Name? <laughs> See, now, I was thinking, uh, since this is in Australia, I was thinking Band Down Under by High Men at Work. Oh, well done. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of Down Under, um, everyone's favorite convicted sex offender, Rolf Harris. Uh, I can do a decent timey kindergartner down. <laughs> uh, say I'd go with um, Sweet Child of Mine. That would definitely be on there. Um, thank heavens for little girls. <laughs> like a virgin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And like 71 other girls, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ramadana, that's a famous one. That's a famous one. <laughs> My favorite would have to be, girl, you'll be a woman soon. And by soon, I mean another 15 years. <laughs> 
<laughs> well played. And for definitely for the honeymoon, um, to get them into the mood, uh, don't go breaking my hymen. <laughs> 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 I wouldn't if I tried. I'll stretch out the edges, but I won't hit the back. You'll enjoy, I'm girthy. I'm girth. I'm a girth man. <laughs> or maybe losing my decision by FGM. Oh. <laughs> All right. What about a what about a little grunge movement? How about a swells like Tween Spirit by Pervana? Oh, fuck. Nice. <laughs> or maybe I'm gonna party like it's nine ninety nine by the artist formerly known as Amir. <laughs> <laughs> this is the, this one's actually a sponsor of our show at one point. Uh, Isis Isis Baby. Yes, yes. yes. They, they, <laughs> stop <laughs> Caliphate and listen. <laughs> oh, how about MC Hammers can't touch this um, because I'm only six years old. <laughs> Smashing pumpkin patch customers. A silk with oh, horse wings. God. Wow. Went Fifty Shades of Grey at the end. How about Truly Madly Feloniously by Savage Kindergarten? Uh, <laughs> the Australian singer, too, from memory. Yeah. I was thinking uh, something by uh, Billy, Billy Idolater. Uh, maybe uh, Robin um, the Cradle of Love or uh, Nicest Day for a Tight Wedding, something like that. <laughs> oh, I, had, I like this one, too, because it rhymes. How about Bloke on the Daughter by Deep Pervert? No, it's Australian. Get my Australian in there. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Uh, You know what? I've got a variation on one of Raz. I I enjoyed your uh, Guns N' Roses reference particularly very much. Um, This this variation is actually from the Little Orphan Irani soundtrack. It's uh, Street Child of Mine. Street street Child. (laughs) Little Orphan Irani. Oh, and a Broadway touch makes the cut as well there. Yeah, no. Yeah. Uh, And and how about At Least She's Not His Cousin by Jerry Lee Lewis? Um, (laughs) <laughs> the, the eagles, uh, no life in the shaft land. <laughs> or maybe, uh, maybe the red hot children poppers with caliph fornication. <laughs> <laughs> maybe a little diddle miss, little miss can't be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> the, the gym doctor. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Um, I'm going to sing you one. Would you like? Would you like one in song? Oh, of course! Fantastic! It's because uh, I'm a big Cindy Lauper <laughs> fan. I woke up to a morning prayer. My husband says, "When you're gonna grow you some hair?" <laughs> oh, too young to need boobs. Oh, girls just need to have pubes. <laughs> Can you change my name when you broadcast? <laughs> well, can I well just done, say sir. Wow. We've got to be uh-huh. mindful of the wedding guests um, from the bride's family, so you've got to have age-appropriate songs. So make sure you've got, you've got a Sesame Street soundtrack. Right, because right. Because will be from Kinji. Mm-hmm. Yeah, w- wheels on the bus and, and whatnot. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, the hokey pokey. yeah. <laughs> and the sort of games will be, you know, pin the penis on the pedo instead of <laughs> pin the tail on the donkey. <laughs> I'm glad to know that we don't just play that game in America. Well, Adam, I know you've got some sharks to wrestle, and Ra, I'm sure you're busy avoiding Muslim no-go zones, but we do really appreciate you taking some time out to chat with us tonight. Thank you very much for having me. I can't speak for Ra. (laughs) Of course, if you'd like to hear more from our guests, you can check out the Herd Mentality podcast. You'll find it on iTunes, Stitcher, and, of course, linked on the show notes for this episode at scathingatheist.com. And, of course, for more vulgar hilarity, be sure to follow Ra at FrancoSoup on Twitter. Thanks again, guys. Take care. time for the part of the show that comes next, listener feedback. This is the part of the show that typically contains the highest adverb to conjunction ratio, <laughs> if you do the math. Our first message comes from friend of the show, C-Web, who went on Twitter to correct my misidentification of California as the Sunshine State while we were discussing the suppression of sodomites last week. Mm-hmm. At first, I assumed, I guess I, I just wasn't paying attention and I missed the error, but after it was pointed out that Dr. Dre made a similar reference in California Love, I realized that 
I actually hadn't made a mistake at all and was instead subconsciously referencing unfamiliar hip hop lyrics. Well, there you so, go. No yeah. mistake on my part. Plus, plus, I think Florida's governor just outlawed saying stuff that reminds people that Earth is melting. So the name is probably available if California wants it. You know, they could be the Sunshine State and the Golden State. Also wanted to throw a quick thanks to Shane on Facebook for keeping me humble by pointing out that no illusions is an anagram for no one laughs. <laughs> and Enright is an anagram for new girth. So... Basically, Heath getting fatter. Yeah, neither fantastic. of us are getting complimented. But given your love for abortion jokes, I really expected you to land on with the hanger. You don't want to land there. <laughs> now, we also got a message from Pretty Lady asking us that age-old question, boxers or briefs? Now, my answer is no. So, Mr. Lusions, your thoughts? That I wish I could unknow that. <laughs> and finally tonight, we got an email from a listener taking us to task for devoting a whole four minutes of last week's show to a self-serving segment about how voting for us in some stupid award show would be awesome. The email was filled with long, self-congratulatory paragraphs about how if he had the ear of as many people as we did, he would spend his efforts shining a light on the problems that religion causes in the world. And oh. that's a good idea. Maybe we'll yeah. uh, give that a try sometime. Fascinating. Since he brought it now, up. Now, yes, one of us may have gone down to his office and slapped the dick out of his mouth. But, but still, we know more about both jobs. <laughs> well, there you so. go. But the key thing this emailer gets wrong is that the idea that winning a podcast award is all about us. But this award isn't just about stroking our egos. It's about the future of the human race. Which, of course, brings us to our top ten ways you can improve the world by voting for us in the podcast awards at podcastawards.com every day between now and March 24th at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. All right, number 10. A lot of Mormons are praying that Mormon Faircast is going to win again, and if we win, they're just that much closer to realizing that God either doesn't exist or hates them. <laughs> number 9. We will personally send a letter to Iran with a map of every <laughs> single secret <laughs> nuclear missile silo so they can have them peacefully removed. <laughs> We're being, like, bipartisan now. Oh. Number eight, it reinforces the message that there's a market for atheist entertainment and puppy rape-based <laughs> comedy. And there is. The world could use more of both. <laughs> Number seven, a vote for the scathing atheist is a vote for using an EMP to disable casino security while we rob their vaults. <laughs> Number six, upon seeing our success, Joel Osteen will be that much closer to giving up his faith and using his teeth for the powers of good. <laughs> Number five... They might be forced to let us give a speech in our, you know, standard, friendly, conciliatory, not at all offensive tone. So that'll be fun. <laughs> Number four, it increases Heath's visibility ahead of his 2016 presidential bid. <laughs> Number three, we'll use the prize money to pay for Chelsea Manning's hormone therapy. <laughs> There's no Thomas. prize money, but yeah, if no, there was. <laughs> Number two, if we lose, we'll have no choice but to spend eight minutes trying to convince you to vote for us next year. And that's really going to piss this guy off. We'll never get around to talking about religion doing bad shit then. And the number one reason you should vote for us, I will personally take several prostitutes off the streets of Las Vegas for several minutes. <laughs> and trust me, guys, Heath's really gentle. So if it's not for us, do it for the hookers. <laughs> that's all the feedback you get. If you want more, keep sending us those emails, tweets, and Facebook messages. You'll find all the contact info on the contact page at skatingatheist.com. Before we empty the clip tonight, I wanted to add a quick note about the Podcast Awards voting system. Every time you vote, they'll send you a confirmation email, and your vote won't count until you click on the link in that email. If you've already voted and you haven't confirmed your votes, no worries. Those emails are probably still in your inbox, so it's not too late to go back and validate all of your votes. Anyway, that's all the blasphemy we've got for you today, but we'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be on the lookout for a new episode of our sister podcast, The Skeptocrat, on Monday at 8 a.m. Eastern Time. And in the obligatory completion of the great podcasting circle jerk, you can also hear us on an upcoming episode of The Herd Mentality with Adam Reeks. Speaking of The Herd Mentality with Adam Reeks, I want to give him another big thanks for joining us tonight. In order to get the whole three-nation panel working, the dude had to try to be funny at 7 a.m. his time. Now, I'll leave it to you to decide whether he succeeded, but I'm sure that if he'd had all the morning cobwebs shaken out, he probably wouldn't have started singing about pubes, so perhaps it was all for the best. Obviously, I also need to thank the lovely and hilarious Ra for joining us as well. It was a more reasonable hour in her time zone, granted, but after a long day working elbow-deep in vaginas, it was, in her words, quite an effort to put up with three more cunts when she got home. 
And for that and the Hyman jokes, we thank her. Of course, we can't shut it down without thanking Heath for basically working all the time that he's not sleeping or making coffee to keep the shows coming out on time every week. I need to thank the beautiful Lucinda Lusions for more things than I can possibly cram into an outro and a few things she probably wouldn't want me mentioning here anyway. Also need to offer a big thanks to Iago the Pigeon, both for providing this week's Farnsworth quote and for shitting on Donald Trump. Here's hoping that defecating on an influential brainless zealot before recording a Farnsworth quote becomes a tradition on this show. But most of all, of course, I need to thank this week's best people, Robert, Richard, Bill, Roy, Chris, Daniel, Other Chris, Aga, Jonathan, Ryan, Other Other Chris, Robert, Doton, TJ, and Mike. Robert, Richard, Bill, Roy, and Chris, whose condoms could provide aerial coverage of a sporting event if you added some helium. Daniel, Other Chris, Aga, Jonathan, and Ryan, who, according to Evolution, were kind of the point all along. And Other Other Chris, Robert, Doton, TJ, and Mike, who are so mighty their hometowns had to install perpendicular guard arms to protect the trains. Together, these 15 phenomenally fuckable, philanthropic, free thinkers helped us piss off religious believers and piss on religious leaders once again this week by giving us money. Not everybody has the grace, glamour, grit, and gumption that it takes to give us money, but if you think you're up to the challenge, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash scathingatheist, and by so doing, get every episode a little bit sooner and a little bit longer, or you can make a one-time donation by clicking the donate button on the right side of our homepage at scathingatheist.com. And if you'd like to help, but you're pissing away all your money on higher education or insulin or something, you can also help us a ton by leaving us a glowing review on iTunes, by following us on Twitter, liking us on Facebook, and of course, voting for us daily at podcastawards.com. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you'll find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingatheist.com. All the music used in this episode was written and performed by yours truly, and yes, I did have my permission. Always wipe front to back.